Good afternoon and thank you for joining us. My name is Moan Offer, Marketing Manager at Energin, and I will be your moderator. In this webinar, you will hear Dr. Paul Comet, Energin's US site lead, speaks about making smarter decisions using Genomagic, and Dr. Yael Maoz, Technical Solutions Manager, demonstrating the Genomagic system. Please keep in mind that we will save time for questions at the end, and you are most welcome to send us some during the presentations using the questions tab. Paul, you may begin. Thanks, Moran. Thanks for the introduction, and thanks to the audience for taking the time to hear about Energene's platform. Today, I'll be giving a brief overview of how genomics data is being integrated into breeding programs and the limitations of a single reference genome. I'll follow that up with an introduction to Energene's unique system we call Genome Magic, which allows for the organization and utilization of sequence-based genetic diversity. And then afterwards, Yael is going to give a demo highlighting a number of the capabilities of the system. As many of you know, the reference genome assembly is, is fundamental in functional genomics and plant improvement projects, including gene discovery. And in this figure, I'm showing southern leaf blight resistance gene discovery through a positional mapping experiment and the need for the underlying sequence information that identifies that underlying causative loci. Genomic modification, including the identification of key sequences for CRISPR modification, transgene identification, and methods of mutagenesis also require genomic sequence for gene functional analysis. And third shows the integration of the genetic map and the physical map, which are key when utilizing any form of marker-aided breeding. In all these cases, the underlying genomic sequence is the foundation for the advancement of the project. All of these capabilities are often integrated into large breeding programs. So depicted here is a simplified breeding pipeline, which involves the initial parental crosses of varieties to create the diversity in the population. Testing is then used for subsequent selection of progeny for advancement in the pipeline. The ultimate goal of all these breeding programs is really just to stack positive genetic variation. Many programs integrate the reference genome information for breeding along with DNA markers which identify diversity among the lines. A marker program is often used to identify the markers associated with traits under selection such as the disease resistance I just showed. Multiple breeding methods and potentially genetic modification methods are used also to generate additional diversity. Molecular markers are then used throughout the breeding process to identify, track, and select for chromosome regions, which we often refer to as haplotypes. Most of the time, genetic variation is detected through the use of a single reference genome, which is assembled from a single plant variety or individual animal breed usually. And then to look at diversity, low-level resequencing data depicted here in red short reads from a diverse set of lines or breeds is then mapped to and compared to the reference sequence. This shows certainly the ideal situation where all reads map evenly to a unique place in the genome, but this is really not reality. What usually happens is that many of the reads depicted here in green do not map to the genome or are difficult to place in unique positions, so many reads are ignored. In addition to many reads uh, stacking up or, or being difficult to map due to copy number variation or extensive, vari uh, or extensive variation on the sequence level. This results in limited discovery, usually only identifying SNPs and very small indels. In many plant species, including maize, the use of a reference genome isn't really adequate to capture the enormous amount of sequence variation that's prevalent between the different varieties. So in these two papers, Ed Buckler's lab, as well as Michele Morgante's lab, showed that about half of the maize genome is not shared when comparing homologous regions between two of the common maize varieties, such as B73 and Missouri 17 on the right, or B73 and CML247 on the left. 
This is really due to extensive structural variation involving transposons, translocations, and presence-absence of genic regions. This presence-absence variation has been shown to be associated with important traits that both breeders and geneticists select for in study. In this study I'm showing, Ed Buckler's group mapped SNPs to the reference genome, in this case B73, and to regions that were not in the reference, but mapped as presence-absence in the genome of other lines. They showed that the presence-absence SNPs exhibited enrichment in significant associations with traits such as the one shown here, like days to flowering, plant height, and ear height. So structural variation is both very prevalent and also functionally important, making the single reference-based approach lacking in the ability to accurately track these regions. Enagene has a different approach than the one utilizing a single reference. Instead, we develop a pan-genome based on full de novo assemblies. A haplotype database is then developed that captures sequence variation, which gets positioned into this pan-genome. The combination of, these, of this information allows for efficient marker design, as well as imputation of full sequence for genomes that carry the haplotype information in the system. After working extensive, extensively with the Genome Magic system, Joe Clark, a Syngenta research scientist, stated that the genetic diversity management with energy system are a step above the conventional means, like the ones I just described, and it enabled clear value gains in cost and time. Here are the foundational steps that build into the Genome Magic database system. The left side depicts the components that build the initial pan genome and the capability to perform genome to genome comparative analyses using these full assemblies. The right side describes the haplotype database, which captures the full sequence based diversity of your germplasm. Yael is going to be explaining through demonstrations how this database can be used in downstream analyses of the germplasm. I'm going to share some of these foundational concepts concepts related to the construction of the databases. First, the development of the pan genome requires the de novo assembly of a small number of diverse lines. Energenes developed efficient algorithms that utilize multiple Illumina-based sequence libraries to de novo assemble complex genomes. The resulting scaffolds in the assemblies have unprecedented scaffold N50 statistics and have been shown to contain highly accurate sequence data, as well as capturing the structural variation found in complex genomes such as wheat and maize. Heterozygous genomes are also phased into their haploid complement. In addition, in polyploid species, scaffolds are accu accurately placed within the proper chromosome complement. These assemblies are then utilized in the next step of genome-to-genome -genome comparison but even high-quality publicly available reference genomes can be incorporated into these analyses. With a set of reference-level genome assemblies, we perform an all-by-all -all genome mapping, along with the placement of gene models to determine presence, absence, and copy number variation across the genomes. So what do I mean by this genome mapping? In this example, we see two genomes, A and B, and we are mapping uh, genomes one to another in multiple combinations, in all combinations when we have multiple assemblies. And this creates a mapping file for each pair of comparison. This mapping file positions sequence from one genome to the next. After locating gene model regions to each genome, we can then determine in a pairwise fashion if genes are presence, absence, copy number variation, or translocated in relation to each other. Gene models can be tagged with a color code to indicate their variant features in relation to the genome. Okay, I've now described the development of the mapping capability and the comparison of these multiple assemblies integrated 
into this pan-genome database. With such a structure, we can now more efficiently capture and describe the diversity across the genome. This is accomplished through a lower level of sequencing and incorporation into what we call a haplotype database. The database can be utilized in a number of ways, including the efficient design of markers that can maximize haplotype diversity identification with the fewest number of markers. In addition, the database can simplify the imputation of markers back to full sequence information underlying these haplotypes. Okay, to capture the diversity of sequence-based haplotypes, we perform lower coverage sequencing of lines, which represent the diversity in a target germplasm. But unlike what I was, talk I was talking about earlier about uh, mapping reads, the sequence we do at about 30x coverage goes through an assembly process which produces longer contigs, and this assists the unique positioning into that pan genome. As you can see below, in an example in maize, a 30x coverage assembles to an N50 of about 11 kb. And 70 to 97 percent of these sequences can be mapped into the pan genome. That is, they can be uniquely positioned and compared to the pan genome. This is unlike the reads that I was talking about earlier, where many cannot be mapped at all. In this way, then, we can capture all types of sequence variation, not just SNP data. This is in contrast to other methods that map the short reads into the single reference genome. In building the haplotype database, we capture only the unique sequence difference that define a given haplotype as compared to all the others. We call these stretches of sequence differences haplotype markers. As you can see in the figure, haplotype markers are different from SNPs as they contain the unique full sequence that's present in one haplotype but absent from others. This makes them highly informative dominant markers that are extremely frequent in the genome, making them ideal for imputation. And importantly, these sequences represent all types of variants, including insertions, deletions, translocations, rearrangements, as well as SNPs. The sequence information of all these different lines can be ordered and summarized into haplotype blocks, depicted as colored bars here, sharing colors indicates shared haplotypes. Here you see a visualization developed in what is called the IGV browser. And Yael will talk a bit more about this browser. I'd just like to give you this visualization. You're looking at the 10 chromosomes of maize as labeled across the top. The tracks on the side or rows represent 31 diverse maize lines. And some of these lines are those that are assembled de novo uh, as reference genomes. While many of the others have been sequenced to about 30x coverage and their haplotype markers defined. In either case, we can summarize the full sequence diversity through this color coding, which represents the sequence similarity or difference across each region. And Yael is going to show this feature later in the demo. Okay, to give you a, a little better understanding of the utility of the genome magic system, I want to show you a genome comparison using a usual SNP array to the sequence-based system I'm just describing here, genome magic. In this case, we've taken um, a region of chromosome 1 in maize, which represents about 400 KB in the B73 line. The publicly available Affymetrix 600K SNP array, so 600,000 SNPs, uh, was mapped to that genome. In this region, there's 167 markers positioned in B73 in this 400 KB. When we compare two maize flint lines, and so flint lines are very different origin from the B73 dent type maize we can really detect two very different haplotypes. In the Flint 1 line, nearly all of those SNP markers I'm describing as 
as blue tick marks are monomorphic. That is, they detect the same polymorphism as detected in B73. Such a long stretch of uninformative, what I would call uninformative markers, are usually thought to indicate a region of identity or a near identity in sequence. Okay, this can be compared to the second flint line below, flint 2, where 59% of the markers show a polymorphism across the region. And so that's the, the green tick marks, while 41% of those markers are still monomorphic and, and really uninformative, and that's the blue interspersed markers in there. In this case, many would infer that this region is unique due to the polymorphisms in those markers. But the monomorphic markers essentially give us uh, a kind of false information or background noise since they don't show this true haplotype difference. This is in contrast to Energene's haplotype marker system. In this same region, there are 1,610 haplotype markers, 10 times more, recorded in position in the database for the B73 genome. Remember, these are sequences that these tick marks now represent full sequences that uniquely identify the B73 haplotype in this region. In Flint 1, more than 95% of the markers are also found in Flint 1 haplotype region, indicating that there's a shared haplotype due to the positive sequence match between the two lines. In the case of Flint 2, 95% or more of the B73 haplotype markers are actually not present at all in this region. Instead, this region contains numerous unique haplotype markers not found in B73, represented as the green tick marks again. In this, sequence difference gives us a clear and unambiguous ambiguous haplotype difference based on true sequence differences. So the data in the genomic in the genome magic system brings clarity and precision in calling this sequence similarity and diversity across the whole genome. Okay, we've covered the full genome magic pipeline, including the construction of the databases and the foundation concepts here. Genome magic is a cloud-based Hadoop system integrating uh, the databases that I've described. Access to the data is through an API calling layer. Energene has built tools, including a query system and the IGV browser I mentioned before, to easily access information for visualization and downstream analysis. Yael will now demonstrate some of these features. Hello, everyone. This is Yael here. So glad that you're able to join us today. I'll be providing you with an intro. Thank you, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us today. Okay, I wanted to just take a moment to thank you all who have submitted questions already. Uh, we've already seen some coming in. Thank you so much. Please keep them coming. We'll be responding to all questions at the end of the webinar or personally by email. So today I'm going to be sharing with you a uh, demo of the Genomagic system. And as you've heard, Genomagic creates a large structured set of databases, which anyone can access through our secure API infrastructure. Now, for those of you who are less food savvy, uh, we've designed an intuitive user interface that also allows researchers and breeders from quite broad background to explore the extensive genomic diversity held in the database and to visualize the use cases that they're working on through our customized genome viewer. Now, the user interface is called the Genome Magic Workspace. And within the workspace, we have several different query types, which can be designed uh, to support readers as they seek to explore the diversity uh, within your germplasm. So I'm just going to go over a few of those with you now. So these are, we have several different query types. And as you can see here, the first one is PMD. So PMD stands for polymorphism detection. This is our standard polymorphism detection tool. We also have a query that enables you to do a QTL or a GWAS analysis. 
We also have population haplotype similarity. Now this is used for visualizing and measuring the diversity across your germplasm. We have a haplotype search, which searches the database for samples with a specific haplotype. We have a haplotype markers query, which can be used for visualizing the haplotype markers for any sample and extracting the haplotype marker sequences from the database. The SNP markers query allows you to extract SNP markers which meet the search criteria from within the query. Lastly, the FASTA sequence. Now, this last query is pretty straightforward. It's enabling you to extract FASTA sequences directly from the database. But what makes this feature unique is the ability to extract homologous sequences based on the coordinates from another genome. Now, while there are currently seven query types which are supported by the workspace, we're constantly developing and seeking new ways to serve the needs of researchers and plant breeders. We really love receiving feedback from our clients on new features that they'd like to see added to the system or how we can make it more user-friendly. So please do be in touch. We love to hear from our customers. So now that we've provided you with some background, I'd like to give you a glimpse of the functionality of these queries and the insights that they offer. So let's dive right in to explore the Genome Viewer and then we'll go ahead and try out some use cases. So this that we're looking at right here is the Genome Viewer known as IGV. Now, some of you may be familiar with IGV. It was originally developed by the Broad Institute and was made open source, which basically enables anyone in the world to use and modify the software code. So while originally the software did not suit uh, multiple simultaneous genome analyses, we've since made several modifications which enable this pan-genomic view of our products that you just heard Paul talk about. So I'm going to touch on several of these features that we've added as we go through today's session. And of course, please don't be overwhelmed. Energene's clients naturally receive in-depth training and support in how to best utilize the system for their purposes. So while we will move quickly through today's session, please don't feel overwhelmed. Now, one of the key features that we wanted to include in our version of IGV was the ability to move from genome to genome and to move from one set of coordinates to a homologous set of coordinates in another genome. So you'll notice here that we've added tabs to the genome viewer, just as you would see in any sort of regular internet browser. So you'll notice here that we can move back and forth. And you'll see here that we've loaded several files into the session. And each file that's loaded becomes a track in the session, as shown here. Now, the genome that this information is sitting on is that of the genome of B73, which is the publicly known maize reference genome. And the tracks which are loaded here relate to the genome magic transcriptome analysis, which identifies presence absence variation and copy number variation between genomes. Now, in publicly available tools, you typically be comparing two genomes at a time. But because GenomeMagic provides multiple high-quality reference genome assemblies as part of the database, we actually have the ability to compare multiple samples at once using any one of them as a reference. So you can see we've actually done PAVC and V analysis on all of the reference genomes loaded into this session. Now, in this example, we're using the B73 genome as a pivot line for comparison to four other samples, which are shown here. Um, and the last track that you would see here, that I've shown here actually up at the top, is the B73 annotation, which we can zoom in a bit more here, and you can see how um, we can actually observe the intron and exon junctions of the gene models which have been loaded into the viewer. Now, in this way, you can quickly visualize um, as well, any genomic uh, variation which exists between all these different genomes, um, at least in the context of their gene space for this view. So um, 
for our first use case, let's imagine for a moment that we wish to identify variation across multiple genomes associated with uh, CAMK, um, protein kinase gene. And all I need to do is to make a search within the viewer. I'm going to take this gene ID. And I'll go to our viewer. And I'll do a search for this gene. And I can go directly to that space. And there we are. So as you can see here, we've got the gene annotation as well as the color codes associated with the PAVC and V analysis. Um, and here, using the color codes, we can quickly identify the samples which have structural variation associated with this gene. So the color codes can be used to identify things such as translocations, copy number variations, in the case of the pink here, um, as well as PAVs and matches for the gene, shown in the blue here. Now, um, a match gene, as indicated by the blue here, actually indicates that the gene exists in the other sample at the homologous location. So we're looking at here, we can see this gene here, MO17, and we can actually go to the tab feature. Using this tab feature, we can go directly to that position. So let's switch now to the MO17, and you can see here that we're right back looking at that gene. We're at the homologous set of coordinates in the MO17 genome. And you can see here that um, because Genome Magic Database is supporting that all-to-all -all genome mapping that Paul talked about, the resolution of this mapping is such that you can actually observe contraction or expansion of the genomes in the homologous locations just by watching the ruler here at the top. So we, even if we switch to other genomes, we can see changes in the uh, genome size and structure. Okay, so for our second use case, let's switch things up and let's um, now talk about another use case and that would be um, that of the Y1 locus. So let's imagine that we found ourselves with a new genome magic system and that we're interested in the Y1 locus. Now the Y1 locus is associated with the carotenoid biosynthesis pathway and variation at this locus has been known to cause a white endosperm phenotype in maize. Now, as a researcher, what we ultimately want to discover is if we can identify a haplotype associated with this locus, with this trait, and whether we can identify candidate markers for identifying this phenotype in our germplasm. So, um, let's again use the gene ID to go to this location. We can see here that all of the um, comparisons which were made to B73 are all matches. But many researchers um, would realize that really the first step to examining diversity in this region, they might think to use a, they might want to look for polymorphisms. And they could do that using uh, the PMD query to identify polymorphisms between a sample with a white endosperm and a sample. Um, with the yellow phenotype. Now, in the UI, in this workspace here, I've input, I've input the region associated with this locus and specified the genomes that we're going to be comparing here, okay, the two samples. And I've, um, I can mark either of the samples that I'm comparing as the target sample and you, because that's going to be the genome on which I'm going to actually visualize the results of the PMD analysis. So here we're using B73. That means the results uh, will be returned on the B73 genome set of coordinates. Um, so when the analysis is complete, we can see in the viewer the first few lines of the VCF file that's generated, which documents all the polymorphisms that are found. Now this is just a snapshot, just the top part of the file. Now, to view the output in the viewer, what we would need to do is to copy the URL 
uh, from this query using quit function here. And we can go back to the viewer and we can load that directly um, using the file load from URL feature. I've already preloaded this just to speed up time and I have that located for us here. And what we can see here um, in this tab is that I've added the annotation track of B73 as well as the results of the PAV CNV analysis between B73 and CML247. Those are the two samples with the white and yellow phenotypes. And what we can see here is the gene associated with this locus is present in both genomes. Um, and when we look at the PMD results, we see that, of course, as we might expect when comparing two sequences, even in a highly conserved region, we're going to see lots of polymorphisms. And the different types of polymorphisms are shown here in different colors. So SNPs, for example, would be shown in green. And when we look at this analysis, we're sort of left with a question of what these, what's going on with these polymorphisms. You know, we want to know which polymorphisms are functional, which are conserved. And what we most want is to identify a marker that could be used to track the haplotype associated with this trait across many lines. So while PMD enables us to examine polymorphisms between two samples, if we really want to understand the underlying haplotypes and to find the best marker for these haplotypes, we need to look beyond this one-to-one -one comparison of the PMD and make some additional queries to the system. So let's go back and let's um, proceed with our next task, okay? What we want to do is to work on identifying the haplotype associated with this locus um, by examining all the haplotypes in our germplasm. So to do this, we're going to make a population haplotype similarity query across all the samples uh, in our germplasm or in our Dana version. And when we submit this query, we're going to get the, the results back. And what we can see is that uh, we can observe this distribution of the diversity as the samples are going to be grouped according to the genetic distance between these samples. And you can modify the way this grouping is done just by changing the slider there. And um, you can also uh, see a table, a matrix of these scores um, notating the genetic distance between any of this, these samples. Now, of course, I'm looking at full genome scale here. You can also look at for specific locations to look at the population haplotype diversity across a given region or the full genome level. Now, once again, if we want to visualize this in the IGV, we can do that by just copying the URL for the results and loading that directly into the session. And from here, we can get an idea of the diversity held in the germplasm as we zoom out. So now what I'm able to see is the, identifying the haplotype blocks, which are shared between all samples according to the coloring of these blocks. Now this is a quick way to get a bird's eye view of the results before we're zooming in to explore the data in finer detail. Now we'll go back to that location that we were just looking at, the site of our Y1 locus, and we can see that there's not quite as much diversity in this region, and we want to have a better understanding of what's going on here. Now, one of the things that we can do is add phenotypic data that can be associated with whatever trait that we're looking at. So in this case, we're talking about the coloring of the endosperm. So you can see here that I've loaded um, this information into the system, and I can sort the samples according um, to this trait. So the first two samples here are those that have the white phenotype. We have some with an unknown phenotype, and we have some with a yellow phenotype or possibly uh, white or possibly yellow type phenotype. So we know these are yellow, these are unknown, and we just have two that have a known white phenotype. So um, by navigating to this region that we're interested in, we can actually identify if there is a haplotype region which is shared by the two uh, samples indicating that they have shared haplotype. As you can see here with the pink, we've ident successfully identified some unique haplotypes in this region, 
um, in this part, but that they also share a haplotype in this region. Um, so if we wanted to, we could actually use the coordinates here um, to extract the uh, FASTA sequence for uh, one of the samples with the white phenotype. So, for instance, I'm going to close this here. And by using the set of coordinates that we were looking at, we can actually extract the sequence for the sample that we're interested in, that with the white phenotype as shown here. Now, um, for our third task, let's think about what we would want to do next. And you know, we're looking at a, a big group of samples, um, a lot of germplasm here, but maybe what we really want to do is we want to identify there are other samples in the database which have either of the haplotypes associated with this white phenotype. So to do so, we're back into the workspace, and um, what we're going to do is we're going to make a haplotype search query. And here what we've done is we've entered the coordinates for the two haplotypes that we're interested in finding a match for. These are the samples that we just looked at with the white phenotype. And we're now going to search the database okay, across all of these samples um, to find uh, samples which have the best match to these haplotypes. Okay, and in the search results we can see, we can sort these by their scores. And what we see here is that we have a third sample which may be of interest to us. So in addition to the two samples, CML and LX9801, which both had the, um, the white phenotype, we also see a third line that could be of interest to us. And this is really great. We now have a candidate for further examination of this phenotype that we're interested in. So this sort of takes us to our fourth task. What we want to do is we want to find the best markers for this region. Right, because we're all about markers and tracking down our traits. So we want to identify the best markers for this region, which is going to accurately identify either of the haplotypes associated with this white phenotype. We're going to need to make another query, and that would be the haplotype markers query. Now, um, I've set up two queries for you. This first one is going to extract all of the haplotype markers in this region for all the samples. So let's go ahead and get that going. And the second one is going to be a bit more targeted. Now here what we're looking to do, you can see this is the haplotype markers query. And what we're looking for here is a query for markers which exist in either of the two samples, okay, this one and this one that are shared. Um, which also, which do not exist in any of the samples with the yellow phenotype, as I've shown here. Now we can submit this query, and we can actually visualize both of these outputs again in the IGV. So if we want to see all the markers, we can see all of them at once. And this can be very empowering, but yet a bit overwhelming. Um, but when we when we really fine tune the query and we search for those markers which will specifically identify this haplotype and in the context of the larger population, we can really narrow it down to just a couple of markers. So once you've identified these candidates uh, for marker development um, and identifying these samples with the haplotypes in germplasm, we can actually open the VCF file, okay, which you can pull directly from here. Just download the VCF file and you can open it directly and you can actually use the sequences for those markers right here in this file and begin using those for your marker development program. Okay, and that gets you going. Now, for our last use case, we're going to run a QTL analysis for a biparental population based on phenotype data for southern leaf blight. So the novelty of this analysis in Genomagic is that you have the ability here to perform this type of analysis based on low coverage GBS and array data, which has gone, undergone imputation uh, for haplotypes. And all that you need uh, to run this query is phenotypic data corresponding to the samples in the system. So all you have to do is upload your file of your phenotype data directly into the system and submit your query. 
Now the results of this analysis can be viewed individually. Okay, you've got each of the associated files uh, presented here. So you have the bed file, cont file containing the regions for the QTL, or the whole set can actually be viewed all at once by launching IGV directly from the workspace. Um, so here, let's switch back over to the IGV and we can see, to see what that looks like. So we have two ways we could look at this. We could look at it at the whole genome level. You can see all of the chromosomes across the top here. Um, and you can see uh, the underlying data as well for all of these samples. So here we're going to zoom in. And we can actually see um, the underlying data for each individual sample that was used in this analysis, as well as the recombination regions um, being clearly defined here. And we can even sort these according to their distribution. So when we go back over here, we can see the QTL as indicated in the, in the bed trap shown here. So as you can see, the Genome Magic system really provides a new and novel way for researchers and breeders to engage with their large-scale genomic data with a modern approach, a pan-genomic view of their germplasm rather than that single reference-based view. Now, in this demo, we've covered applications in both the Genomagic workspace and the Genomagic viewer. And I've shown you today how easily you can use these query mechanisms to ask questions at the genetic level or the haplotype level. We've also demonstrated, of course, the ability to integrate legacy phenotypic data into the system, as well as how Genomagic can use even the low coverage data to impute haplotypes for use in a large-scale genomic analysis. You know, this could be used in things such as GWAS, QTLs, genomic selection. So lots of opportunities here. So I hope you've enjoyed this demo. I really look forward to working with you and I uh, hope we get to know each and every one of you and supporting you and getting the most from your germplasm. So thanks for watching, everyone, and I'll pass things back to Maren. Thank you very much, Yael. Um, we will now answer questions. Paul, the first one uh, was addressed to you. Do you incorporate PEC biodata into your assemblies? And if not, why? Um, can you hear me, Yael? Yes. Yes, go okay. ahead. Yeah, so, um, you know, in principle, there's nothing wrong, of course, with PEC biodata, wonderful data, but in practice, what we found is that uh, Illumina data is really the most cost effective for the accuracy and the assembly uh, quality that we get. And so it brings a lot of value to the customer in that way and it's tuned to our algorithm in that way. Um, yeah, so, that, so that's really how we look at it. Um, it is about bringing the best quality assembly to the customer for uh, the best value. Thank you, Paul. Um, we have another question for you. I work in animal genomics where there is much less structural variation. Do I still need a pan genome? Okay, so the, the pan genome helps, like I explained earlier, helps uh, move what Yael is describing from genome to genome. So really, this is going to be very dependent on the extent of the diversity in the in the population and the animal uh, genome that you're working in. So uh, it's very important to consider all types of genomic variation, which often might not even be known at this point uh, with that animal. So really, we'd have to look at uh, what's known about that particular species uh, and make a determination with the technical team to understand uh, what you want out of it and and what's the best way to get at the diversity in that population. Okay, Paul, thank you very much. Um, Yael, the following question is for you. Can you bring in another annotation to the IGV? Yeah, sure, of course. We've worked with many clients to integrate their own transcriptomic data. We can also utilize any publicly available data sets and we, of course, work with all of our clients to integrate 
um, whichever data that they're currently working on. And, um, you know, IGV, while it is a modified version that was developed by NRGene, um, it's still capable of loading any GFF3 file, VCF file, BED file. It accepts all those standard, um, standardly used genomic formats. Okay. And uh, we have another question for you, Yael. I have extensive sequence data for my organism. Can you use this data in your system? Well, I guess, as most of you know, sometimes the answer to that is it varies. Now, of course, we have specific guidelines which relate to, of course, type and quality of the data that can be used in our system. Um, in order to optimize kind of the expected results, we consider this on a project-by-project -project basis. So, of course, we're going to sit down, we're going to discuss your research needs, um, and, you know, we'd be happy to refer you to your local sales rep to discuss your particular needs in detail and happy to work with you. Thank you very much, Yael. Um, I'm sorry we couldn't answer all the questions, but please note that we will answer them all in writing after the webinar. Thank you, Paul, and thank you, Yael, very much. Your presentations were very lightning. And thank you all very much for joining us. This is it for today. Uh, enjoy the rest of your day. Thank you.